I know I don't normally do video introductions, but just for this one, uh, especially because it's very long and I would like people who aren't familiar with the IDA community to watch this, um, I've been developing an IDA for about 14 years now, and this video covers my development history um, and just sort of how the community and how the leading IDA vendor is, how it's like to be an IDA developer, and why you don't want to be an IDA developer. There's better languages to learn. There's really only one benefit that IDA really provides, and no, two, two, two benefits. And you can usually implement them in other languages a little bit differently, but you can still get them. So, if you're interested in Ida, please watch this video and reconsider. So I know it's been quite, quite a while since I've really done any kind of update, uh, any kind of content, really. Um, For many months, I really didn't know what I wanted to do with the channel or exactly what direction I was taking with programming. And a big part of that wound up being because I just had enough with the IDA community. Uh, I detailed that in another video, and I just want to say that that was definitely not an emotional reaction. I still strongly feel that way, and there was... It was a while uh, feeling that leading up to eventually making that decision. Uh, that was something I mulled over for several months uh, before finally uh, deciding that. So I want to give a little bit of backstory about me as a developer and the sort of my experience with two very different worlds. Uh, because this isn't and has never been an uh, argument about how things should be, but an argument about how things can be better. Which, to be fair, they, they still should be, but it's not just like an ideal, it's they definitely can. I guess you could probably say that I really started programming uh, just fiddling around with game development. Um, just RPG stuff, you know, some of the combat logic and how things work, uh, damage calculations, shit like that. Nothing really that special, because we're talking very basic games within an engine that provides almost everything for you. That's that's where I first got exposed to programming. Now, I've always been quite a bit of a gamer. Uh, the interest in it has died down a bit, but I still, I still love the media. I, I definitely game more than I watch TV or movies or, or shit like that. Um, you know, I'll buy a new video game before I go out to a concert. Different strokes, different folks, though. So, so that started when I was about 14, and it died off pretty quickly. I, I, I sort of realized that... I, 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 so I still have on the back burner just this ideal of... I would like to develop a game at some point, but realistically, it's probably not going to happen because there's a lot of work, a lot more work than people think that actually goes into it. Um, for a good one. But I realized through that I do enjoy programming quite a bit. And from there, I, I decided that I wanted to learn to program. So I had dabbled a bit with some languages, and one of the ones that I found that I actually resonated with me was Ida. I, I really liked the syntax for the most part. I, I really liked a lot of the design goals of the language. Uh, now, with my experience, I don't think a lot of those design goals were met very well. Um, but overall, I still think it's a great language. 
but that's it was a pain in the ass to learn which is a big reason why i started the the, the channel and did so much edit content at the time there was pretty much nothing and i have a video detailing this as well but it was overwhelmingly just books and memorizing shit from the ada reference manual which that'd be like going to the ECMA standard for C sharp and that being how you learn C sharp that's really not an ideal way to do it I mean you're gonna wind up knowing a hell of a lot about the language and its intricacies uh, as you learn a language it's certainly a good idea to to reference that for some of the specifics but that shouldn't be your primary mode of learning that's a really bad way to learn So, this pretty much started happening around the time where I was 15, so that means as of now I have about 14 years of experience working with Ida. Um, but since it was so difficult to learn, I would get frustrated and I kept dabbling in other languages. Like I'd said, there was always something about the language that resonated with me, uh, so I kept going back to it. But I dabbled in other languages and I do wind up thinking that was highly beneficial because I wound up seeing concepts from other languages and what they did well and it's a big reason why I stand by my attitude of they're different tools for different jobs not one superior language and that's okay one of the other languages that I had dabbled with that resonated with me was C Sharp. Now, I really didn't start to take C Sharp seriously until uh, I was about 16. Uh, yeah. No. 17. That was later in that school year. I would have been 17. Um, so that puts that at about 12 years of experience, possibly 13. Yeah. So, those two largely wound up being what I focused on. Still found myself very interested in language in and of itself. Um, so I periodically check out languages, uh, new stuff that had cropped up, the ex extensions of other languages. Um, for a while, like, Numeral was a sort of extension of C-sharp, where it was basically C-sharp, but added some stuff. Um, not in the same vein as TypeScript, which is more seriously of an extension. Um, there were incompatibilities between Numeral and C-sharp, but uh, that, that idea. Or um, just radically different languages. That was how I got exposed to... Uh, Snowball and the Icon group of languages, um, specifically Unicon. Um, but again, Ida and C Sharp were largely the ones that I, I focused on. Now, as I had said, Ida always kind of resonated with me, so that was the one I had focused mostly on. And that was the one that I had done the majority of my development in. And, well, I, 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 look, I deleted the repos. I, I don't have the code anymore. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But you'll unfortunately have to take my word from it unless somebody wants to dig up the posts from Twitter or Facebook. God, I don't use Facebook anymore. But they were up on there. Um so there is proof out there on the internet, but it's not in the repos anymore. Um, the performance of some of the things I had written, especially the containers library, outperformed Adacores in most situations. The performance of it was really, really good. 
um, while also providing just some nice features like uh, some basic support for queries. You know, it doesn't have a Ada doesn't have a nice language integrated query. You know, link. Um, it doesn't have to specifically be C sharp's link, but that kind of concept. Uh, but did have uh, the, some of the methods required. Well, they don't call them methods in Ida, but the functions uh, required to do some some basic queries. And uh, it's it's useful to have. But performance was good. I had also. The, the code quality of this one was absolutely terrible, but I had written a uh, standards passing IDA compiler. Like, again, the, the performance was absolutely abysmal. Um, at the time, I didn't know some of the stuff I know about good language, uh, good, good parser design, good synthesizer design, and stuff like that. I had to pick recording back up on another day, so hopefully things aren't too broken uh, as far as the flow goes. I, I think I pretty much got where I left off. Um, so it was with containers and how the containers performed well. And, uh, there were other like utility libraries that I had worked on. Um, one of the things I had mentioned in a lot of the Ada Tools updates was that get the fuck out of here. Um, was about how in Ada it's quite easy to make um, multi-target isn't quite the right word, although sort of, but package variants I, I took to calling them. Uh, where the specification is exactly identical, but the body is different. And as long as you're using a standalone library, you can just sort of swap them out. Now, it, the thing I had mentioned is that a lot of the stuff that I had been doing is rewrites of old libraries. Those old ones I'm keeping closed source. I'm going to... The, the, the plan was to discard the old stuff... Uh, once the the new stuff was rewritten, but yeah, and we'll we'll get to that. Um, the old stuff used some manual build scripts. Uh, that's how that worked, and that's what the Ada Tools project basically was: was taking some, a lot of the advanced logic in those build scripts and automating it. Um, but one of the things, like the mathematics library, could have a normal implementation that did array or vector arithmetic uh, the way you would expect without any specialized support, so that it is iterate over the arrays and perform the operation element by element. Um, but there was an implementation for the 80686, uh, as long as it had, uh, well, actually it varied, but the various SSE instruction sets, for the most part, th th there were some uh, additional stuff. Um, but as long as it supported those, uh, would actually break the thing into appropriate units that the uh, vector component could work with and send it off to that and have it do it. Uh, but the interface was exactly the same. So, some pretty fucking useful stuff. Uh, that happens to be, really, I would say the biggest uh, focus uh, for me as a developer is making things that are very usable. Um, performance is probably second. Uh, it, it's it's way up there, but I, I, I would say... Uh, usability is my single biggest concern as a developer. Um, if it's not usable, people aren't going to use it. That's kind of... I mean, it's a tautology, but that's... I, I, for some reason, that needs to be reminded uh, to a lot of people. Um, the stuff has to be usable. People forget about user experience. A lot. So, 
so and I'm not sure what more I really want to say there um, but just the point is that I had done quite a bit as far as developing things for the community to, to, to use and it definitely was used by the community um, not to a huge extent all the awareness I had to basically do myself um, I hate the guy and that's not something I want to get into I, I'm trying to keep this to not be a negative video um, Olivier Henley if him and I definitely don't get along um, but to be fair uh, my stuff was up on his Ada, awesome Ada repo so that was basically the extent of any kind of uh, acknowledgement from the community um, never anything in the uh, Complang Ada Usenet group um, I could try but Me posting anything there kind of got uh, went south a while ago. Um, older email account, if anybody is interested in checking on that. Uh, it's not the current email account I use now. Uh, I used to go by a different name, and I'll. We need to talk about that. Cause there's this is this this will come up. This will come up. So I'll. I'll talk to about that when I get there. Um, those libraries really aren't the only thing I've done as far as the community goes. I'm, obviously, if you're watching this, you're aware of the YouTube channel. Um, but one of my earlier software projects um, was with the Aurora, U Aurora UX project. Um, I found it quite neat at the time because I shared one of the unfortunately toxic attitude of a lot of the ad community has in that Ida is this somehow superior language and that other things could benefit by being written in Ida. Now, that's not true. Uh, certain things that Ida excels at will obviously be better if written in Ida over a language that does not excel at those things. Um, if it happens to already be written in a language that excels at the things it needs to excel at, rewriting it in another language that also excels at those things won't actually improve anything. But really the thing that matters is your... a combination of co company culture and engineering principles. Uh, good engineering principles will lead to a well-engineered design that again is basically a tautology but that that need to remind people of that there's actually some things that contrary to the how it's sold uh, the Ida really needs some extra special care because it's vulnerable very vulnerable to certain uh, problems so good engineering principles regardless of the language are really what saves you but also company culture. Uh, how much focus, how much resources do you really put towards dealing with bugs and stuff like that? Um, no language will save you from no quality control. No language will save you from really no bug testing, no unit testing, no integration testing. Uh, you need these things. But also... No, there, there is no also. Um, I was working on the Aurora UX project uh, during some of the earlier stages. And specifically, what the thing that I was focusing on was... And keep this in mind, because this is going to come up later. I was one of the initial people working on taking Nat and Giggy, yanking it off, uh, basically rewriting Giggy for something else. We were looking at LLVM and basically porting Nat onto a different synthesizer. So that is. 
wind's picking up. Um, I'm gonna move just in case. Porting NAT onto a different synthesizer. That is the component of a compiler that does the code generation. Um, the other side being the analyzer, which is sort of the combination of the parser and lexer. Um, obviously, these things can vary a bit. But... I had decided the project was kind of horribly mismanaged. Uh, one of the big things was that we had changed the source control management system we were using three times before I had even finished planning. Yeah, that was bad. But inevitably, I did stick through long enough to get the plan down, get enough stubbed so that Nat and Giggy could be built um, independently. And then, then I, I abandoned the project. Um, yeah, I was one of the original guys working on that. It's going to come up later, I promise. So... Is there anything else I needed to touch on from my past? I guess not really. I, I'll mention it just because it'll be real quick. I, I have worked on other projects a bit, um, although n not really all that much. I, I found that I, I really... I don't know. I, I don't know how I want to word that. Um, Interacted quite a bit and did some minor bug fixes with Plan 9 and a little bit with Haiku OS. Um, some stuff here and there with some, I guess we'll call them indie compilers, uh, small independent compilers. Um, sometimes for more major languages, sometimes uh, unique languages. Uh, Seed 7 is one of those, although I... Um, other than some very minor stuff, like two bug fixes, I don't think I really did much. Um, most of my stuff with Seed 7 was definitely just studying it. But... Oh, no! I almost forgot one of the most important parts. Okay, so... Another one of those things that I did privately, and there were numerous revisions of this, um, more as learning experiences than anything else, and is why I happen to know quite a bit about compilers and language and stuff like that, is that one of the projects, with the, uh, the one I'm talking about right now, obviously, um, was on... An Ada compiler. A standards passing Ada compiler. Now it performed fucking terribly. Uh, even the second revision of it was just bad. Uh, it's actually really difficult to write a compiler. Um, not so much the working, although that depends on the language, and Ada is a complicated language, so in that case, yes. But it's really, really difficult to write a compiler that performs well and generates code that performs well. Uh, if you think you're going to do it as part of like a, hey, let's just do this for fun, n please don't do it. It, it, n please don't. Literally, the only reason I stuck with it for long enough to, to do that uh, was just because I happened to, I mean, that was how I found out I really like working with language stuff. Although the thing I've definitely found is I'm better, considerably better, with the analyzer side than the synthesizer side. Um, so, in the future, if I do something, it's going to be building just the analyzer and attaching it to a synthesizer like GCCs or LLVMs. Um, 
you know, just building the front end. But I have a working IDA compiler. Again, it's it's bad. Um, but clearly that's enough to demonstrate a substantial knowledge of the language. And again, from anybody watching this channel, you not surprised by that at all. Now, one of the things I had decided when I had decided that I had was basically done with the RREUX project was that it wasn't that NAT needed to be yanked off GCC uh, and put onto LLVM because LLVM was somehow superior. Um, I do think it is, but as far as code generators go, they both produce remarkably good code that is very competitive with each other, and you really have to benchmark your stuff, in both of them, to know if your specific use case is faster in one than the other, uh, because they are highly competitive with each other in that regards. Um, the advantages of LLVM are elsewhere. Not it, the, They both have excellent synthesizers. Now, what I had felt after doing all that work was that it was Nat and Giggy that were the problems. That what really needed to be done is write a new front end for Ada, not put Nat onto a different back end. Um. That's because of a lot of the ways they work internally. There's a lot of duplicated work. Um, there's a lot of odd behaviors. Uh, one example of duplicated work, which happens to be a very easy one to uh, investigate, which is why I'm bringing it up. Um, strings, null terminating strings. There are functions to do this inside of NAT, and they... What are you? And they, I mean, they work. They they do the null termination. Um, but you don't need to. They're used extensively throughout Nat, and Giggy already null terminates strings. So what you generate is actually a string with two null characters at the end of it. I'm not kidding. R run, uh, like, attach a debugger to the actual GCC synthesizer, and you'll wind up seeing that. Um, it's fun. Now, when you pass those into the various C uh, functions, and if you're using that uh, text IO stuff, you are still using the C functions. As much as that's going to trigger some of you Ada people who despise C for some bizarre reason, uh, you're still using that underlying behavior. Uh, so what, what, it gets written properly, uh, but for a, a while there's two null characters that don't need to be there. But it's uh, Nat and Giggy are filled with those kinds of things that are just bizarre and. Um, I think really demonstrate a lack of understanding uh, for the people who are developing them. Oh, I, I need to partially rephrase that. Um, I mean libnet. There, there's a, a null term. There's a function to add null terminators to strings inside of libnet, uh, and then that function is called extensively in. Oh God freaking wasps. And then that function is called repeatedly inside libnat. Um, not inside of the... Well, actually, I don't know. It might be inside of the, the, the uh, nat analyzer as well. I don't, I don't know. Um, but I know it's, it is definitely one of those cases where uh, work is being duplicated still. I just, I'm trying to be as uh, accurate as possible here. Because there's going to be some people picking this video apart. Um, what do I want to say now? 
Okay. So I had done this development for a while, gotten the a, a decent amount of libraries up. This was before any of them were open source. Um, this wound up uh, consisting of a collections library, or containers library, which had uh, stack queue, priority queue, uh, singly linked list, doubly linked list, uh, both of which could polymorphically be referenced by just the list. Um, so you could swap out implementations but not have to change your code. Uh, the only time you'd need to use specifically the doubly linked list uh, as the actual value type is if you needed some of the specific enhancements. But, um, there was a skip list, which again would polymorphically be... Uh, be swapped out. Um, I didn't get into trees. I'd wanted to, but I didn't get into trees. Uh, and that largely had to do with me not finding a good starting point. Because um, there's a lot of different types of trees. There's a lot, a lot. Um, and, and, and a few others. Uh, ring buffers and stuff like that. Um, there was the mathematics library, which had general functions, trigonometric functions, uh, with a polymorphic array type. Um, so that is, you had an array type, um, but then initialized it using, um, like a degree type or gradient type or radian type, um, basically to implement units inside of a language that doesn't have support for units. Um, this wound up using some trickery uh, with a base number that was actually an integer of a very specific range where it would convert cleanly uh, into both degrees and gradients um, so that you didn't have any rounding errors. Uh, and it was specifically an integer, one, so that the rounding errors didn't happen, but two, for performance reasons. But it was happened to be a very large integer um, doing that whole uh, trick that older games and stuff used to use where, you know, you'd have like a integer of range, I don't know, zero to, I don't know, 100,000, but because it was intended to represent 0 to 100, you actually had, what, four extra digits. Uh, that would be essentially the decimal place. Or the, the, the fractional part after the decimal place. Um, I, I made use of a lot of little trickery where things would superficially be what you wanted and expected them as, but uh, for performance reasons, we're doing the better things. Uh, you know, that, that, that balance between usability and performance. Uh, there was the arrays and matrices, uh, combining uh, them to get uh, the entirety of uh, vectors, linear algebra. Um, and like I had said, there was a package variant uh, for that. There was a color model library. So that, I never gotten around to implementing color space support, but the models were all polymorphic on a base color type uh, with no actual representation. But I had implemented uh, grayscale, RGB, HSL, HSV, HC, uh, HCI or HCL. I don't remember actually an uh, HEV. Uh, and oh, what is this one? R RGBOG, RGBO. Hmm. Red, green, blue, orange. Cyan? Magenta? Whatever that last one was. I don't remember anymore. Um, 
with all the appropriate conversions so that all of the properties that they had uh, could be referenced. Um, so that even includes things like having just an RGB type and getting the orange channel as if it had the orange channel. Um, console library for convenience. Although that got a lot better in the rewrite, uh, the original one is kind of crufty. But so between that, things that actually performed really well, and the compiler, which didn't perform well, but was good learning experience, and importantly, demonstrated a very good grasp on the language. I thought, hey, I really like this language. I want to contribute to it. I want to be a professional programmer. Let's try to get a job at AdaCore. Oh boy, that did not go well. I got the interview. I got to that point. I got told, we don't think, we can't see you as ever being a developer. Well, that, that led to a suicide attempt, which obviously was not successful. Along with... Uh, about a week in uh, the mental ward. Uh, a lot of lot of therapy after that. Uh, definitely one of the one of the worst times of my life, and uh, eventually got to the point where it was like, all right, let's. Um, I can move on. Um, if they don't want me, then they don't think I can be a good developer, despite the um, the proof, despite the, the the benchmarks. Then I guess I do this on my own. I guess, and I could try for one of the other Ada vendors, but. I really don't think it's appropriate to charge for your compiler. Um, charge for some of the additional stuff, sure, but your compiler and your IDE, I, I really don't think it's appropriate to charge for those. You you want people to use your language, and when there's a startup cost to just learning the language to decide if you even want to use it, that's rough. And that's why certain languages just don't really catch on. That needs to be free. So I, I didn't really want to to work um, for those companies. I didn't want to support that because that's something I fundamentally disagree with. So there was a while uh, after that where I had um, sort of obsessively been uh, going over every everything um, that I had written, uh, trying to refine it, trying to learn as much as possible about uh, performance improvements, uh, further performance improvements, and um, you know, really trying to educate myself as much about uh, the design principles, um, you know, like the benefits of object-oriented design and where you really benefit from that versus situations where you don't want to use that. Uh, same with like fluent design and functional programming and so on and so forth. Um, I learned a lot during that period, definitely. Um, couldn't squeeze too much more performance out of the stuff that I had written, but... Um, no, I'd still learned a lot of very useful stuff during that time. So then after a bit of that, what I had uh, sort of switched to, sort of not switched to, um, focused on, uh, was they, they don't know what they're talking about. I have found 
all of these bugs in the past that I've sent patch reports, uh, not patch reports, I've filed bug reports and sent patches in fixing the problem for them, and they tell me that, oh, that's not really a problem, and it's like, well, if it's not a problem, how the fuck did I fix it, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, I have a video on my biggest pet peeve on that one, which was the Unicode support for Windows. I fixed that throughout the entirety of Libnat and got told that I didn't understand what I was fixing. That you still can't get Unicode support on Windows, even though I had fixed it. Even though I had demonstrated in that video that I can. And even though Microsoft does it, <laughs> you think they 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 know their own product, you know, if if they can get it working, then clearly you can get it working. So whatever. I guess Idacore knows more about Windows than Microsoft does cuz you know that's not arrogant or anything. Well, if they're going to be like that, they're going to constantly reject these fixes. They're going to I don't I don't know if it's more arrogance or more demeaning me, um, but either way, just whatever, fuck them. Then I'm going to try to build up my own stuff, whether it's my own company, software solutions company, or consulting service or something. I'm going to try that. And I'd actually still really like to, to do that. Um, it just won't wind up being what I have. Ah, it's still windy out here. I want to sit outside because it's nice, but it's windy and the microphone tends to pick up really badly for you guys. Um, I don't know. I have a new camera, actually, or new phone. Um, using as a camera so it might be better for that i know the video quality definitely is i don't know how <laughs> when, it, when it comes to picking up the the um the wind uh, how would it be with that um so yeah obviously uh, if you're doing going more the independent route you need to to bring awareness to your stuff and so that's where I started working on getting everything um, that I wanted to be open source as open sourced uh, and took the opportunity to go through and audit all of it, you know, forcing myself to rewrite every single part um, so that I don't get lazy, so that I absolutely uh, I'm thinking about every single thing and if it could be designed better or should be renamed or whatever. Um, rather than just throwing it in a GitHub repo and, and there you go, it's public. Uh, actually, that was originally up on Chisel App, which is for Fossil. Uh, I think Fossil is actually the overall better uh, source control manager, but GitHub's definitely the more popular one. And I'll still keep using Fossil for internal stuff, for stuff that I don't plan on sharing with everybody. Um, at least the source code doesn't get shared with everybody. But the public stuff, I mean, it's not like it's bad. Because it's definitely not bad. Git Git is definitely a uh, it it works. It definitely works. Um, even at scale, the Linux project uses it to great success. Um, so throwing it up on GitHub's fine. It's not my preference, but it's fine. So that's how that started. And from there, most of you probably have an idea about the rest of this. Unfortunately, this was where a lot of the praise and recognition from newcomers and 
absolute hatred from existing members started. And I'm not the only one to have experienced this. I have received numerous comments over the uh, two years. I think two years. Pretty much all detailing the same kind of thing that I've encountered. Now, some of these I'm not going to link to, to largely to protect the identities of the people that um, sent them, because there's some stuff in the messages that are... Um, in, just give an idea of who said it. Uh, but... I'm, Hopefully, I haven't forgotten and have been linking it, or uh, uh, inserting um, some of the more public ones. Like if it was some, something somebody said up on YouTube, obviously if it's public, I don't mind sharing it because it, they obviously decided that they were okay with it being public. Um, you know, I'm not the only person that's noticed toxicity in the community. And the thing is, I haven't really encountered that with other communities. Like I had said, I have been programming in C Sharp for almost just as long. I really haven't encountered the problems in the overall .NET community like I have with Ida. I develop something, even if it's basically competing and outperforming something Microsoft has had, and I actually have, uh, in one instance, a team at Microsoft reaching out to me, offering me help if I want it. Look at the difference in that. For almost two years in development, Idacore had never offered help, even if it's just like, hey, I'm having some trouble figuring out how to use this. There doesn't seem to be much documentation. Uh, can you give a little snippet or explain something? Nah. Nah, they won't do that. They're, uh, Trying to play a little bit of the good, good victim right now. Uh, I'll say this first, actually. Uh, one of the other things, and I had alluded to this, uh, was that there really hasn't been much shout out from the community, and there is a community-run uh, Twitter page. It's not. Um, and to be fair, it says in the bio, but its general presentation is not really that. Uh, it's run, it, the Ida Programmers Twitter. It's, it fully discloses it is run by some Ida Core employees. Um, but it's easy to miss that if you don't go and look at the Twitter bio. I definitely met some people who didn't realize that was the case. They thought it was just general community members. And I, I've, it's been more than one or two people. So it, there's definitely um, a misconception going on rather than somebody just being a little stupid. Um, never a shout out from those guys. Never. I know recently, and I'll fully admit I blew up. I still think I'm in the right. Uh, that being said, I probably could have handled it better, but I will admit that I blew up um, when they had said that they had implemented the first Ada and Spark extension for VS Code. What? The actual... Fuck. No, you haven't. The first one was, I believe his name was Alessandro del Sol, uh, an employee at Microsoft, 
Uh, this is not an officially endorsed project at Microsoft. It was probably like one of the Microsoft Garage projects or something he just did in his own spare time. Um, but he had done an IDA extension for VS Code. He had done it quite a while before mine, and definitely before AdaCore. As far as I can tell, his was the very first extension. Now, there's also one from Luke Guest, or Lucrecia. Again, a guy I don't like, and I've butted head with him numerous times, but in being fair, he had an extension out before AdaCore. His is not up on the VS Code Marketplace, and I think that's a mistake on his part. But again, there is an extension mm -hmm. that exists for it before Idacore. And then you have mine. That's three right there. That's a three extensions for Ida right there. This is not the first. And it seems like they're trying to whitewash history a little bit using their sheer size and shitting on the community. Now, I lost it a bit because they have a particular history of doing that with stuff that I have developed. Just a few weeks ago, maybe months, they announced, Hey, guys, we have ported NAT to LLVM. Are you fucking serious? Now, this video is already quite long, and I don't want to put tons of these examples in there, but so far I have counted seven of those. And so help me fucking God if I find any of my code in there from anything other than the VS Code extension. Because that one is public domain. If they want to use that, they can. I'm a little salty about how they presented it, but if they want to use my syntax highlighter, they can. And they probably should, because theirs is really bad. I find any, any indication of my code existing in their stuff. I know it is not a license that they uh, can integrate with. That initial work I was doing was under the CDDL, which is not compatible with anything that IDACOR has used before. So either they released that under the CDDL, which I'm pretty sure they didn't, or None of my stuff better be in there. But the amount of times that this has happened before makes me think that it probably is. So, yeah. The conclusion I have come to, and it's before the shit today, Ida Core and the Ida Programmers Twitter. For months now, I've been mulling over whether I even really want to be an Ida developer anymore. Not a developer. I still love programming. But whether I want to be an Ida programmer. Do I want to spend large amounts of my time contributing to a community that clearly does not respect me, who has a company that is completely willing to copy things that I have done without giving me credit for, or at least a nod, willing to pretend 
that prior work from myself and others doesn't even exist, that they are somehow this savior and the only ones doing anything. And community members who are willing to do things like insult me for my race, insult me for disabilities that I've had. Can't put a link for that one because I reported the comments and YouTube stripped them. Um, I didn't want to screenshot them as reminders of what was said, but it's happened. Um, all the while, having programmed in C-sharp, almost just as long, and never encountering any of this. Well, no. No, I, I don't want to keep doing that. So, over the past few months, I had ported pretty much all of those libraries to C-sharp. There's still some finishing touches I'm making. Uh, it has to do with making sure that I don't re-implement anything that is already in the CLR without good reason. Uh, so that means that my containers implementations are actually not getting implemented in C Sharp uh, in any of the .NET languages because they don't really need to be. Uh, Microsoft happens to already be using quite good performing collections. And that's surprising to say, because this is Microsoft. But, no, they, they actually really are. Um, I'm sure some uh, improvements could still be made. Uh, maybe what I'll do is add in some of the missing collections, some things that they didn't implement, and do my own approach to that. Um, but I really have no need to implement that, because they're... I benchmark them extensively. They're performing basically the same as mine. There's some minor performance differences, but not anything that I can say uh, mine has a good use case for compared to theirs. Theirs does really well. So, oh, there was one exception. My stack outperformed theirs. But for one container, nah. Nah. It's not really worth it. Now, that's not to say everything that Microsoft does is phenomenal. Uh, the last video was on Stringier, a, an alternative approach to pattern matching parser generation stuff. It's complicated because it's an engine, and because it's an engine, it can be used for different things. Um, but it really gave... I mean, it, it, it outperformed Microsoft's regex implementation in most situations. Um, and now the situations where I lost don't even matter because I have a regex adapter. So, yeah, the few times that Microsoft wins out, well, let's just use their implementation anyways. Because that's cooperation, you know? We can work together. I, I don't mean to shit on them at all. They actually... Some of the stuff that I had uncovered when extensively benchmarking them, like, they actually did a pretty goddamn impressive job. Seriously. It's surprising. Um, no, ultimately, I think the regex approach in general has some faults, but it's, they, they did a really good implementation, all things considered. So... I know this isn't an issue with me, and I know that because, again, I haven't encountered this at all in other communities. A lot of the criticisms that the EDA community has levied against me are not criticisms that I have ever encountered in school, in the workplace, or in other programming communities. Only from them specifically. Now, if it was something like, oh, why does every girl I date gotta be such a whore? Well, that's probably because of me. 
something about me. I don't know. It's sort of an example because I happen to watch a lot of the r slash uh, nice guy and r slash nice girl compilation. So that's just like the first thing that popped into my head. But you know what I'm talking about. If it's only happening in a very specific case, it's not you. Because it's not happening all the time. And I can further back that up. Because it's not just me having the same things to say about the general community. Nor about how Adacor handles bug reports or handles um, criticisms of their product and so on. There's a very large amount of consistency in the Adacor community. Very clear pattern. So, yeah, very long video. And for those of you who don't like very long videos, I'm sorry, but there was a lot that needed to be said because this is sort of a major deal. Um, but I feel it's for the best. I, I, I really, really do. Um, the stuff that I've been doing in .NET have been uh, going over really well. And honestly, it, it gets a lot more criticisms than it really should, especially when it comes to performance. Because I think a lot of people look at those toy benchmarks and take them more seriously than they should. It's toy benchmarks. And there have actually been problems pointed out with a lot of the way the benchmarks are taken for many languages. And... Yeah. Try to get your evidence from journals. Or just measure the specific thing. Don't look at toy benchmarks, though. I am still not entirely sure what I want to do with videos going from here. Uh, there happens to be a lot of very excellent people doing videos on uh, C Sharp and Visual Basic and F Sharp. And there just really isn't a need for another person doing those. So I may still do videos for that with some of the oddities, some of the unique approaches to things that really haven't been covered before. Uh, I've got one on struct, uh, enum structs and enum classes that has not been covered. I don't think. I don't think I did that video. Maybe I did. Um, but there's others, like on how to get structural inheritance working, because that's something you can do. It's a little weird, and there are some pitfalls, but it's just like how you can get uh, structs with reference semantics. Um, it's not, you can't use them exactly like classes. But you have the reference semantics. Same idea. Uh, you don't get everything that you get from classes, but you can get an inheritance and polymorphism setup with structs. So I think maybe some advanced topic videos would be good to do. Because again, I don't want to dilute the, 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 the video ecosystem when there's already excellent videos from uh, various .NET programmers. They don't need more of that. My videos won't wind up getting much views anyways. Um, although they probably get more views than the other ones, because, oh boy, it's Ida shooting itself in the foot. But one thing I also want to do, because, look, I'd, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a bit salty, and I know that's come across a few times in this video. Something I would like to do is a small little video series on Ida, just to finish this up, on pitfalls in Ida. Severe vulnerabilities it has, and design decisions that make you feel good about your code, but are actually very prone to bugs. Because those actually exist in Ida. The big areas? 
There's a lack of ceiling for classes, at, for tagged records. That's really bad, actually, that you tend to design things. Um, thinking you're in a sealed environment and somebody can easily go and inherit it and you inherit your type and, well, because there's also no fine-grained visibility, accessibility, um, you have free access to everything inside that record once you've inherited it, and oh boy, you can break things. You can really break things. And then there are problems with how you know, switch case statements, they don't actually require you to have a default. They go, oh hey, I checked this for every valid value, and it looks like you handled all of them. What about the invalid values? Because you can pass invalid values through it. A lot of bad decisions. A lot of really good decisions, too. Again, don't get me wrong, I really like the language, but I would like to point out that it's not anywhere near as perfect as some members of the community think it is. Because at this point, I'm done with the community. So my last hurrah can be uh, Let's draw some attention to some of its problems. Until the next video, have a good one, guys.